Right. I found my bulletin, by the way. It was in my Bible. <laughs> boy, oh boy. I'm kind of scatterbrained today. So anyway, it's the way it is. All right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 5. <clears throat> John chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 18 today. John 5, 1 through 18. And the message is entitled, What to Do When Jesus Crashes Your Pool Party. <laughs> John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. And uh, as you're turning there, I'm thankful to have a friend of mine, Paul, here today. I don't like to normally single people out, but I hope he's okay with that. But Paul is one of my street preacher friends, and he's been on the streets for quite a while with us, off and on, doing different things. So I'm glad he's here. I hope you'll make him welcome. Uh, he's been easy, he's been down in New Orleans with me several times. So, anyway, all right. If you're able, please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda, in Aramaic, which is the five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of disabled, blind, lame and paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. He replied, The man who made me well told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you, Pick up your mat and walk? They asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Do not sin anymore, so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And Jesus responded to them, My father is still working, and I am working also. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we come to you today, and we thank you that regardless of life circumstances, we can trust you. And you provide for us all that we need to make it through those circumstances, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, today we're looking at the story of a man who was lame, who was paralyzed. He was this way for 38 years, Lord. He longed to be made whole, but yet he was unable. And then you came along, Jesus. You met him. You spoke to him and asked him this important question. Do you want to be made well? I thank you, Lord, that you had an encounter with this man because it was life-changing. And Lord, we know that whenever we have a true encounter with you, it's always life-changing. Lord, whether it be through healing or whether it be through salvation, Lord, you are a life-changing God. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts today through this message and God we pray that you'll get the glory and the honor for all that is done we pray all that in the mighty name of Jesus our Savior amen, amen. thank you you may be seated <clears throat> one of the things that I dreaded in school was PE I don't know if anybody can identify with that here today but I've never been very athletic in fact I've always been a little overweight well, actually, in high school, there was a period when I lost a bunch of weight, but it came back, unfortunately. But P.E. was always a struggle for me, especially when we played games like dodgeball and Red Rover and those games that required you to pick teams because I was always 
usually the last one to be picked. And so it was really discouraging. Uh, I knew that games like that meant that the most popular kids were going to be picked first, and then there was the rest of us that were kind of the leftovers. And when they had to acknowledge that we're part of the team, they're kind of like, okay, I'll take him if nobody else wants him. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> do you like to be chosen? Sure you do. It makes you feel special, right? When someone picks you out. Well, today's story is about a man who had gone 38 years and yet he had never been picked. The scene in today's story is by a pool in Jerusalem called Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. And the Bible tells us that Jesus had come to town for the Passover feast and he happened to come by that pool where he saw a great many people lying sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And they were waiting. Waiting. Waiting for what? Well, it seems that tradition tells us that there was uh, some healing power in that pool. That an angel would come along every now and then and stir up the waters and whoever got into that pool first would be healed. I know that the newer translations kind of leave that passage out, but I think it's important to understand some background. So as Jesus scanned the scene, he singled out this one unnamed man. And he began a conversation with him. And this conversation was life-changing. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that Jesus singled me out of the crowd one day. Amen? Amen. And he had a life-changing conversation with me. And I hope and pray that I never forget that day because that was one conversation that changed me forever. When Jesus singles you out and speaks to your heart, the result is life-changing if you're willing to listen and you're willing to be made whole. And so today we're going to talk about this question, what do you do when Jesus crashes your pool party? So the first thing you do is this. You consider his question carefully. What was the question? Go back to verse 6. He says, do you want to be made well? Or older translations, do you want to be made whole? In other words, do you want to be healed? Jesus looked at this man and he asked him this question, which on the surface might seem to be kind of a silly question. I mean, why wouldn't this man want to be healed? 38 years? and he was helpless, why wouldn't he want to be? Well, we'll talk about why Jesus asked the question a little later. When it comes to dealing with people, though, sometimes the answer is not always obvious. I mean, I've met some homeless people out there on the streets that wanted to continue to be homeless. It's kind of crazy how it works. They get out there and they get used to that lifestyle. They get used to not having much responsibility. And then pretty soon they're chronically homeless and they don't want to change. Years ago, there was a lady who used to live in her van down there by Moore Square. You remember her, Miss Betty. And Miss Betty was the nicest lady in the world. She was homeless because of her circumstances. Her husband had passed away and they had a great deal of medical debt, and because of the medical debt, they lost their home, and Miss Betty was out living in the streets in her van. There were several people who tried to help Miss Betty find a place to go, and Miss Betty just didn't want to change. She didn't want to leave her van, and so she never did. She passed away in that van, by the way. I've met debtors who chose to continue to spend money even though they didn't have it, like the federal government, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <laughs> I've met addicts whose addiction had too great a hold on them. Uh, until they are ready, by the way, to get clean for themselves, they're going to continue to be addicts. They can't do it for you. They can't do it for anybody else, but they have to be willing to do it for themselves. And I've met plenty of sinners who love their sin too much and wanted to keep on sinning. So they didn't change. They didn't want to be made well. This is what the Bible commentary said. It says, In the spiritual realm, man's great problem is that either he doesn't recognize he is sick or he does not want to be cured. People are often happy, for a while at least, in their sin. And that's true. 
But I do believe there were some indications that this man did want to be made whole, did want to be healed. The first is this. Look at his longing. Because he came to the house of mercy seeking what? Mercy. He came to the house of mercy seeking to be healed. How did he get there? We don't know. But he knew he didn't get there on his own. He had to get some friends to bring him. Maybe he was like the man who had the four friends who brought uh, that friend to Jesus and they had to take him up on the roof and lower him down in the midst of Jesus' midst. I don't know, but he had to get there somehow. His location, where was he? The Bible says he was lying right there at the edge of the pool. So close, yet still so far away. His longevity, we know that he had been in this condition for 38 years. We don't know if he'd been there every day, but I have a feeling he probably did. Jesus recognized that he had already been there for a long time. And I don't think he meant being there for a long time as in that day. I think he had been waiting and waiting and waiting. Jesus asked this man because he wanted him to seriously think about the implications of what it meant to be made whole, to be healed. He wanted to know if this man was truly sincere. Do, did he really want to change? Because after all, there were going to be some unknowns coming into his life after he was healed, he would have a new set of responsibilities because he would have to go get a job and go to work instead of relying on begging and the generosity of others. More importantly, though, he was going to have to give up his sinful ways. Notice what Jesus told him in verse 14. Yeah. He says, Go and sin no more so that nothing worse will come upon you. There is spiritual application in these things do we really want to be made whole from our sin have we considered the implications of that decision we may be in the house of mercy this morning but the question is do we really want to change do we really want to be different because God's word tells us that if anyone's in Christ they're a new creation old things pass away and all things become new Listen to what Jesus said about the responsibility of those who come to Christ. Luke chapter 14, verses 27 through 33. He says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That verse right there separates a lot of people. <laughs> For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he's laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the unluck onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, This man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still afar off, he sends a delegation and asks for peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. My friends, those are some pretty heavy costs. Take up your cross. Cross was an instrument of death, right? It was an instrument of torture. It was an instrument of capital punishment. So basically what Jesus is saying there is you've got to be willing to die to yourself. Count the cost. If you're going to build a home out here today and you begin to build, you go down to Lowe's and you put all your materials on your credit card and all this kind of stuff and you get halfway through the project and suddenly you can't finish it, what's that going to do to you in your neighborhood? <laughs> or he talks about a king who is considering whether or not to go to war. And, and he doesn't just step into this foolishly. He sits down and he comes to understand exactly what it's going to take to fight that war. If he has enough manpower, if he has enough weaponry, if he has everything that's necessary to win the battle, otherwise he's going to call for peace. And Christ calls us to do all those things, to count the cost of following him. I have a feeling that a lot of people these days 
have come into the church, have, quote, made a decision to follow Christ, yet they've never counted the cost of that decision. And I say that because we don't see a lot of change in people's hearts. We don't see a lot of difference in people's hearts today. They may have received Jesus. They may have prayed a prayer at some point in their life, but they're still living the same old sinful life. Count the cost. I think the next thing that we have to do is this. We have to answer him honestly. When Jesus asked that, that question, we have to answer him honestly. Now, the man responded to Jesus in this way. He says, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. It was first come, first serve. And so this man, since he didn't have anybody around to help him, was laying there helpless. He couldn't get into the pool. He couldn't even just roll over into the pool. Everybody got down before him and they received their healing, but he was not able. And so we look at his answer and we think, well, maybe that's just an excuse that he's making. No, I don't think that's it. I think he was just saying this to Jesus. I think he was saying... Jesus, I need some help. How many of us are willing to humble ourselves and say, Jesus, I need some help? I have uh, just posted on my Facebook timeline, those of you who are friends with me on Facebook, the testimony of a young man named Will Dietrich. And he's one of my street preacher friends. And Will's a young guy. He's a brilliant guy. Uh, he, he reads the New Testament in Greek. Okay, that's how brilliant he is. But before Will came to Jesus, he was on crystal meth. He was one of those skater guys. And in his testimony, he talks about how those drugs took him deeper and deeper into it. Until one day he finally humbled himself and come to know Jesus. You know, some people are not willing to do that. Some people just want to remain helpless and hopeless. It reminds me of the Peanuts comic strip. When the scene where you see Snoopy laying on his doghouse and he's thinking, yesterday I was a dog, today I'm a dog, tomorrow I'll probably still be a dog, there's little hope for advancement. <laughs> That's the spiritual attitude that some folks have. The physical condition of this man is a very vivid picture of the spiritual condition of those who were without Jesus. They're paralyzed, they're hopeless, they're helpless. They need help. You see, because the disease of sin renders us that way, powerless and helpless. Without Jesus, we are spiritual invalids. What does it say in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out our inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as others were also. Apart from Jesus, you're dead in your sins and trespasses. You're under the influence and the power of the enemy. You might not realize it, but he's the one that's controlling your life. He's the one that's controlling your heart. And you need to invite Jesus in to kick him out. Amen? Amen. Our spiritual affliction doesn't get better over time. It's not like getting the cold and then eventually you get over it. No. It actually gets worse. What does James say in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15? He says, But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin is fully grown. When it's fully grown, it gives birth to death. And so it don't get better. <laughs> There's no room for improvement. There's only one great physician who can heal us of this disease and his name is Jesus Christ. And what does it say in Isaiah 53? He himself bore our sicknesses and carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. 
punishment, the punishment for our peace was upon him and we are healed by his wounds. Or some translations say by his stripes we are healed. The cure for sin disease is a cross. There's nothing else. No other cure out there. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, it says, He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Aren't you glad He nailed your sins to the cross? He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in Him. You know, the Bible tells us that if Satan would have realized the implications of the crucifixion, he would have never caused it. <laughs> because Christ defeated him through the cross. Christ crushed the head of the serpent through the cross. You see, this promise of salvation goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, to the Garden of Eden when man disobeyed God. And we see the prophecy there where he talks about the fact that the Messiah was going to come, the seed of the woman, and was going to crush the head of the serpent, even though the serpent was going to bruise his heel. Now, friends, Jesus knew everything about this man. He knew that there wasn't a thing that this man could do about his condition, but he waited for this man to verbalize his need before he did something. You know, I think the biggest stumbling block that's keeping a lot of people from embracing Jesus as their Savior is their pride. Well, Pastor, I've been coming to this church for 30 or 40 years, and if I were to come and acknowledge today that I really didn't know Jesus as my Savior, that would be so embarrassing for me. My name's been on the roll for so long. You're going to miss heaven because of that? I mean, seriously. You're going to miss the glory that God has for you simply because you're not willing to acknowledge Him before men? Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will what? Deny you before my Father in heaven. And I have to tell you part of my testimony. I was baptized at the age of 15. I knew some Sunday school verses. I could answer some questions. But I really didn't come to know Jesus until I was 24. When I met a man named Tim who loved the Lord and I saw Jesus in that man. And one night in the spring of 1994, I went home and I got down on the side of my bed and I said, Lord, I've been living life on my own terms and I'm tired of living this way and I need you to come and take control of my life. I went all those years not knowing for sure whether I was going to spend eternity with God in heaven. And once I made that decision to follow Jesus, it was settled. My name was written in the Lamb's book of life and it will never be stricken because Jesus is there to keep me saved. Robbie Zacharias, unfortunately this man had some disgrace at the end of his ministry, but he was a very brilliant speaker and he said something one time that I think is important. He says, A man rejects God neither because of the intellectual demands nor because of the scarcity of evidence. A man rejects God because of a moral resistance that refuses to admit the need for God. What does it say in the book of Romans? It says, Everything that is evident about God is revealed in creation, but man has chosen to, to suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. In other words, their sin causes them to reject. So seriously, answer the question that Jesus asked honestly. And then the last thing is this. Not only should we consider his question carefully and answer him honestly, but we should obey him promptly. What does it say in verses 8 and 9? Jesus said to the man, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And instantly, the Bible says, the man got well and picked up his mat 
and started to walk. Think about that for just a minute. This is a man who had not walked for 38 years. It's very possible that he was born that way, but I have a feeling it was not the case. I have a feeling it was because he may have been injured and because of that was unable to walk. He hadn't walked in 38 years and now he faced this dilemma. Are you going to trust what this man says? Are you going to believe what he's telling you to get up and take up your mat and walk? Or would he remain in his pitiful state lying on the mat by the edge of the pool? This man could have said, I'm sorry, Lord. I've done this for 38 years now. I've tried before and failed. So I don't think it's going to work. Or this man could have said, Hey, Jesus, don't you need to get some people to put me in the pool? Or he could have said, Who did you say you were? <laughs> it took faith for this man to obey Jesus. And the result of his faith was what? He was healed. His faith brought healing into his life. The Bible says that once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and he walked. Jesus doesn't call people to do things without first giving them the ability to do those things. That's why the Bible says that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father is drawing them. You see, the Father is the one that makes us want to come to Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Neither does Jesus give that power, though, until we step out in faith. You see, I don't believe this man was healed until he actually got up and grabbed his pallet and walked away because it was his faith. Now, folks, I know this story is about physical healing, and, and I truly, by the way, believe God still heals today. Okay? You all know that. You believe that, right? We have no definitive proof that this man received salvation. The point of the story is this. His faith in Christ was what made him whole. And many times in the Bible when it talks about being made whole, it's not just talking about physical wellness. It's talking about emotional wellness. It's talking about spiritual wellness. Many times it refers to salvation. And so, yes, I believe this man was saved by his faith. Look, this is what Jesus said in verse 24, chapter 5. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Let me read that again. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. John 10, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I'll give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. If you're one of his sheep, you'll know because you'll hear the voice of the shepherd. And maybe the shepherd is calling you today. I don't know. I can't see your heart, but he does. And then Jesus in John 17 said this, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. So when it says they may know you, it is talking about knowing God in the most intimate, personal way. And so do you know him in the most intimate, personal way? I want to point out the fact that Jesus called this man to a life of repentance because he said to him after Jesus had located him again he says see you are well sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you now not everybody is having to deal with illness or any of these kind of afflictions not everybody is having to deal with it because of sin but in this man's case it was something it was his sin that brought about his paralysis. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. He's saying, turn to him in repentance. Repentance is not just a one-time thing that we do. 
It's a daily thing. It's a daily repentance of confessing our sins and asking God for the strength to walk away from them in order to follow Him, to give Him priority in our life. And it's a gift. The Bible talks about granting repentance. It's a gift, just like salvation is. There was an ad for the Marine Corps you might have seen many years ago. It pictures a sword, and beneath the sword are the words, earned, never given. So if any of you have been in the Marines or any other branch of the military you know, you know that they don't just give you that status. They don't just give you that sword. You have to earn it. You have to sacrifice. You have to train hard. You have to go for it. And if you get it, you deserve it because you have worked hard. But if you want to become a Christian, you must have the exact opposite attitude. You see, for a Christian, salvation is given and never earned. You can't earn it. You can't save your own soul. God will save you simply by His grace. No one earns salvation. And if you get it, you absolutely did not deserve it. I want to close out with this thought. You might have asked this question a little bit earlier in the message. Why did Jesus ask this question to this man? Why did He say to him, Do you want to be made well? Because, I, again, the answer should have been obvious, okay? But he had a purpose, as Jesus does with everything. Looking a little bit later in chapter 5, verses 38 through 40, he is talking now to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, to the Jews. He says, you don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. And then he says, but you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. You see, the paralyzed man was willing to be made whole, was willing to be made well, but the Pharisees, not so much. They didn't want to come to him. They didn't want to acknowledge that he was who he said he was. They didn't want to acknowledge that their Messiah was standing right in front of them. No, they wanted to continue on in their spiritual blindness, in their spiritual apathy. And so that's why Jesus asked this man that question. Afterwards, after he healed him, because he did it on the Sabbath, the Bible says these men persecuted him. And then a little bit later in verse 18, we see where they wanted to try to kill him all the more. Why? Because he called God his Father and by doing so he was making himself equal with God. And so because of that, they wanted to kill him. They hated him. This paralyzed man received the blessing and they missed it. They missed it. <laughs> Don't miss it. Don't miss it, my friend. If the Holy Spirit is speaking in your heart today, don't miss it. Seek the Lord while He may be found. That's what the Word says. But you must humble yourself. That was the real issue with the Pharisees. They were unwilling to humble themselves like this paralyzed man did. Are you willing to humble yourself in order to be made whole? Join me now as we go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this story today because it speaks to us in so many ways. Lord, it speaks to us about the need for physical healing, but most of all, it speaks to us about the need for spiritual salvation. And Lord, apart from you, we are separated. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. But Lord, you call us to go from death to life through believing in your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross and bore our sin. And so, Father, I pray that you'll draw people to yourself today. If there's someone here who's never trusted Christ, may they humble themselves and come forward and acknowledge their need for you. Lord, if we're believers that have not quite lived up to that taking up the cross, I pray, God, that you'll help us to rededicate our hearts and lives today 
so that we might truly serve you. And God, we put all this in your hands and we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.